Uh, our next talk is by Devon Petikolas. He's a principal engineer at Odin Technologies. Um, this is the, I believe it's the second year that he speaks at Beam Summit. Um, and uh, he spoke last year about um, how they do sort of uh, detect changes in a signal in real time. Uh, and so, you know, I, this year he's going to talk to us about uh, Beam schemas and uh, the benefits of, of encoding your data with Beam schemas and I guess the headaches of, of having data coming in as, as Avro and, uh, and you know, dealing with it with the scheme, Beam schema facilities. Thank you, Devon. Hey, guys. Um, so this is Avro and Beam schemas without smashing your keyboard. Um, and it's a talk largely about, you know, exactly what you said, using schemas, which is, I think, a feature that people really don't spend a lot of time thinking about, and also Avro, which is a really great encoding format, and use them together. And when I first started doing this, it was kind of a headache. So I wanted, this is the talk I wish that I could have watched. Um, uh, whoops. So real quick, all these slides are available on, uh, on GitHub. You just pull them down and look at them. Um, and I'll have this URL at the end as well. There's a bunch of code you might want to copy. Um, so agenda, uh, I'm going to give you a quick intro um, and then kind of talk about what is Avro and what are Beam schemas. Um, we're going to talk about making them work together, which is a big part of this talk. And then we're going to talk about kind of some of the benefits of doing this. So there's kind of two major things that I've identified as a huge benefit of using this together. One is a huge cost benefit, which I don't think is really sold well enough and it's actually kind of the driving one of the driving reasons behind us using it. And the other is that uh, it makes this thing that we do at Odin, which is a combined batch and streaming IO, uh, really, really easy. So I think that's a great thing for people to you know, kind of see. Um, so who am I? Um, I have been a principal engineer at Odin. I've been a Beam user for five years. Um, I lead an efficiency team, um, which is a bit of a catch-all team. But right now, we're focusing mostly on like cost efficiency, and a lot of it's focused around our streaming pipelines and our data ingestion. Um, and this is actually my third Beam Summit talk. Uh, the first one was that um, one that was all entirely virtual. Um, uh, I like burritos, Python, and with allowed timestamp SKU, which uh, has been currently deprecated for, I think, seven years, and I still use it to this day. Um, and my dislikes are hot dogs. They're just inferior burritos. Um, the entire Python Beam SDK and every line of Java I have ever written. Um, who's Odin? So Odin is uh, they're an analytics company. So if you ever use New Relic or Datadog or uh, Stackdriver, it's one of these. But our customer is not, or our user is not a developer. Our user is uh, a manufacturer, someone who's often in like plastics manufacturing, or maybe they're in chemical. Um, I can tell you that you have touched products that uh, have things on them or have run, like their production involved Odin uh, tracking, which is pretty cool. Um, we have a lot of time series data. It's very high write, low read. Uh, it's small data. It's highly compressible. Uh, often, it's a lot of repeated UUIDs, but these very change, small changes in um, values over time. Um, so how do we use Beam? So Beam is really our foundation for our entire ingestion pipeline. So uh, in a factory, there's something called a PLC. This is a programmable logic controller. It was invented, invented by Dick Morley, uh, January 1st, 1968, during a hangover. Um, since then, they have come to, Dick Morley is a great guy to read about, by the way. You all should. He's really crazy. Um, but since then, they've kind of gotten slightly smaller, smarter. They can sort of talk to the internet. They can communicate over MQTT. We integrate with services that run on the factory floor. And we push this data up. And it previously was coming to us over Cloud IoT. Um, we are now consuming it over ClearBlade. And we're definitely not salty about the reasons as to why. Um, and all that data comes in, and it goes directly into PubSub. And then there's this kind of just reading and writing from PubSub and Dataflow to kind of do real-time transformations on this data and make it useful. Um, at the end of the day, the data gets written to uh, application databases like ClickHouse and Postgres, um, which run our platform. And it also ends up getting written to cloud storage and then read by BigQuery. Um, and one of the really cool things about this is that all of our jobs also run in batch versions. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into this. I did a talk on it. You can watch that talk. Um, but this is a really nifty feature where uh, all of our Dataflow jobs we also, in addition to running as streaming jobs, we can run them on this cloud storage data that gets 
where it all gets serialized. Um, wait, no, don't don't play. How do I? No. All right, there we go. All right, that was a mistake of including the actual link. Um, so, okay. Uh, here's an example of an Odin Beam job. So this is kind of the classic example is a customer has two sensors. The sensors, this is like a cable manufacturer, someone who's extruding cable all day. You would have no idea how much of an industry this is. It's absolutely insane. It's all around you. Um, and they'll have two sensors, and the sensors are measuring the width of the cable and the height of the cable, and they really just care about the average. So what we'll do is we'll do a real-time streaming join on those two metrics, and we'll combine them, and we'll create a new metric. Um, and we'll let them define their function for what they want to do in their own you know, definition. We actually run a JavaScript interpreter inside of a Java Beam job. It's kind of hairy. Um, but this is the kind of practical you know, data scrubbing that we can offer to our customers who right now don't have access to this kind of stuff. Um, another example is a state change event. Um, so for example, you might have something that's um, you know, a metric which is responding, how, is saying how fast the line is going. And at the end of the day, the customer cares about things like, how long was my line up? Um, and so when we see the line speed go from zero to something, we know that they're now in an uptime state and we want to identify as a separate an, a event and store that into a table, into Postgres. Um, I also did a talk on this because it's a really weird problem uh, that you can spend a really long time thinking about it. And if you want to watch that one, then you get a full saga of my hair growing. Um, so that was the last year's talk. And how do I, there we go. Um, all right, meat of the talk. Let's talk about Avro and Beam schemas. So Avro is a language independent uh, RPC and serial serialization format. It's similar to Protobuf and Thrift. The big difference is a much cooler logo. Um, it's actually like, I think it's like a British airplane building logo. Um, but the gist of it is basically you define these schemas in JSON. Um, and the JSON is used to uh, actually decri describe how the code, how the data is being serialized. Um, and it's language independent, so you can use it with Java, for example. And that schema is going to generate a Java class. So this is a generated static Java class. It's got that nice little decorator that says of Avro generated on it. Um, and all of these fields have been created, turned into um, private attributes, and it gives you some getters and setters. Um, in Python, in a dynamic language like Python, you don't actually need to generate the class. You can actually just load the schema dynamically. This is a slight difference from something like Protobuf, so it's kind of nifty in that case. And it's also, there's another nice feature of this, which is that uh, Avro files will actually include the schema in the header of the file. So if you were, say, a data scientist and you want to just read an Avro file, you can just load this file into a data frame really easily, and Python can dynamically figure out what it is. Um, in GCP, which I'm going to assume a number of you use GCP, um, since it's pretty popular for Dataflow, um, there are a bunch of really nice reasons to use Avro. So, um, if you have Avro files in GCS, like we do, because we continually write all the data to GCS, then you can actually read all of that with a BigQuery external table. So there's a special kind of table you can set up in BigQuery, so the data actually living in BigQuery lives in GCS, and you just query it as if it were a table. Um, and additionally, if you're pushing the data over PubSub, um, and in this case, you'd be pushing the data over PubSub without a schema. So you'd just be encoding the payload and setting the PubSub data payload to the encoded Avro bytes then you can actually set a schema to the topic, and the topic will enforce that schema on the data that's flowing through. Um, and then kind of looping it all together, uh, there are these things called BigQuery subscriptions. And so if you have a BigQuery subscription, which is a fancy feature where you say, um, you know, I want this pub subtopic to continually write into this BigQuery table. Um, if all of your data is Avro encoded and you have a pub sub, or you have the Avro schema on the topic, this all just kind of magically flows through and writes to a table. So long as you haven't named one of your attributes uh, attributes, I highly recommend you don't do that. Um, you will spend a long time with support getting nowhere. Um, now, Beam schemas are different from Avro schemas. So Avro schemas, to be clear again, are the schemas that are used to define the uh, your Avro type. A beam schema is what we call like a schema assigned to a data type within a P collection. Um, so it's a language independent type system for beam. Um, it's, it lets you do some weird things with multi-language pipelines. I, don't, I haven't met anyone crazy enough to do multi-language pipelines yet, but I hear it's cool. Um, and, but one of the really nice things is many classes can share the same schema. 
Um, and it opens up all these really nifty kind of P transforms. Some of them are very like SQL-like, um, don't really appeal to me. But the really big one to me is it gives you this thing called convert. And so convert, if you have two classes that have the same schema, you can easily translate from one class into another. Um, and this is really relevant to us because Beam works with, uh, or Avro works with these generated classes. And generated classes are cool, but you can't really do much with a generated class. You can't add to it. So the idea that you can convert from a generated class into a non-generated class, we actually find really useful. Um, so let's talk about actually getting these two things working together. Uh, so reading in Java, this just works. Uh, so if you're reading from PubSub, there's a special kind of, uh, so you can define your scheme up here, you can generate your class, and if you're reading in PubSub, you literally just pass that class in, and you say from the subscription, and you specifically pass in with read Avro with Beam schemas. And what that does is the P collection that comes out is going to have a schema assigned to it, and that schema is going to match the generated class. Um, and that also has this added benefit that the schema coder is going to be applied to that class. We're going to talk a lot about the schema coder, um, but that's a really big deal. That, that is by itself a really big win. Um, if you're reading with Avro IO, uh, you get the same thing. You just pass along this with Beam schemas true, and suddenly everything that you're reading in, it's all going to be assigned a schema. Um, now, what we do with our jobs doing this is, is the sandwich. Um, so the idea of the sandwich is the outer layers of the sandwich are going to be these Avro generated classes, and the inner meat of the job is going to be done in like a plain old Java object um, that shares the same schema. So in this case, you can see we have our schema, we have the generated class, we have some sort of POJO, and then we can convert from one into the other. Um, and so this is kind of a really nifty feature where as we read everything in, we have this generated class. And then because they share a schema with some sort of internal representation of like what an Odin metric is, um, we can convert it into this internal metric class. And that internal metric class can have things like getters and setters and you know, nifty, weird uh, you know, functions that give me my timestamp in seven different ways. Um, and just it's a more public API that the, uh, the job itself can use. And it's nice because it means that we can actually evolve the Avro schema over time without changing the inner class that's being used. Um, as long as we maintain the schema mapping between the generated class and the, uh, the job object we're using internally. Um, the way you get them, the way that at least we get them to have the same schema is we just have the same private attributes. Um, and then we can make our getters and setters much nicer names. So if we you know, decide at some point in our lives to name the UUID field UUID, uh, and that was a terrible idea, we can at least have good getters and setters downstream that we don't have to deal with that. We can know that's the machine ID, or the device ID, or the metric ID. Um, uh, one of the really key ways of making this work for us uh, on the writing end, um, so OK, kind of going back. Writing does not work out of the box the same way that reading does, because uh, it does if everything's a generated class, or one of these generated classes. Um, but converting into that generated class in the sandwich method is not going to work as well. So we need to kind of hint to the generated class that it has a beam schema, as opposed to just reading in these generated, uh, you know, reading in these Avro files into the generated class. and. Um, assigning the schema using PubSubIO or Avro.io, we're just going to actually add this decorator, which you would use for a regular um, class that we're using within a Beam job, um, to say that this actually has a schema associated, and this is where it is. Um, so this is a really cool Java annotation thing. You can add into an Avro JSON blob. Um, and that just means now every single time you use this generated class, it's now going to have a schema associated with it. Uh, I personally think this is just easier to do anyway, because it'll make writing tests, for example, much easier. Um, you don't have to rely on PubSubIO or Avroio to assign schemas anymore. It just kind of cleans things up. You could hypothetically assign a um, schema to it in every single pipeline uh, with like the schema registry. Uh, I find that's really error prone, because it tends to be one of those things you don't see until like deploy time. So this is to me, the much safer way of doing things. Uh, and so with this, we've kind of now fallen into this piece where, or this position where we can read from PubSub uh, and everything has a schema. We immediately convert it with the dot convert method into our internal representation. Uh, we do everything we want to do within our job, and then we convert it back into an Avro class, and we write it back out to Avro. 
Uh, in Python, this is just brutal. Uh, the Python SDK is just far less robust about doing this. It's been a really long time trying to make it work. Um, you do get schemas when you, uh, when you consume uh, from an Avro file that has the Avro schema already assigned to it at the top, but there's not really a great way to just consume schema lists or Avro schema list data from files or PubSub in Python. So you can kind of see for us to read from PubSub, we actually have to write our own ptransform that does this. Um, and you can see that we're actually just continuously reading the sub and we, uh, we use the Avro schema list reader and then we convert it into a named tuple, which is the Python you know, representation, which gives it a beam schema internally. I'm saying, realizing I'm saying schema a lot, and this is probably why this was so painful for me. Um, but uh, I'll say that at this point, Odin has, this, has moved off of the Python SDK. Uh, we tried to make this work. We did actually get good efficiency out of making sure that every one of the uh, objects had a schema and was therefore using the right coder. Um, but I mean, it's definitely more performant than the pickle coder, but it just, we hit this wall where at the end of the day, Java is just significantly more performant and cheaper to run. So GCP cost impact. So this was a surprising thing. I mean, I think we kind of knew it going into it, but I think I'm still, still kind of caught off guard by how effective this was. Um, so over the past year or so, my team has been focused a lot on reducing costs, um, trying to bring down, we kind of have a negotiated contract with the business, which is how much do we uh, charge per metric? Um, so we have some sort of fixed cost that's like for every metric we read from every machine, this is how much it should cost us per month to work with that. Um, and our goal was basically just get this number all the way down. And uh, the line goes down significantly. Um, so we've made a lot of progress here. Uh, so we're, it's highly compressible data, um, and there's a very high frequency of it, and it's all very small payloads. So really our goal was like, how do we, we want to reduce the overhead associated with every single message that we're processing. Um, so in the very beginning when we started this, we were actually using JSON as our payload, um, and that was a mess. We always thought it didn't really matter because PubSub has this, uh, this one kilobyte minimum that you, uh, that it's going to charge you the same amount until you're up to that. But I don't think, what, what we didn't realize at the time is that that 1KB minimum doesn't really matter because when you're using something like PubSubIO, it's actually under the hood batching everything uh, internally. So really, you can get the average message size as small as possible. That's just straight savings. So us just going from, uh, going from JSON to Avro without the schema inside of the payload, that was a 76 production or a reduction in the size of the message coming through. And that was a 76% reduction in the, um, the message delivery basic uh, SKU that was charged to us at the end of the day. Um, we also actually saw additional savings in streaming engine cost because streaming engine costs, oh, streaming engines ultimately charging you for how much data is flowing through the system between the few stages. And the very first ones coming in, that, that depends on how big your payloads are coming from PubSub. Uh, so there was a nice savings from streaming data processed. Um, and one additional kind of, we also saw some savings from vCPUs because decoding JSON is just not cheap. Um, and then one additional nice thing is uh, as of June 2023, so like this week, we are working on this right now, we've actually started to migrate away from this method where we write continually to GCS and then read that as an external table or run our data flow jobs off of that GCS data. And we're actually moving to uh, BigQuery PubSub subscriptions because of the change in BigQuery physical storage. Uh, pricing. So the physical storage pricing is like a higher price per byte, but it's charging you for compressed bytes, and our data is highly compressible. So we actually see a 95% decrease in cost um, by setting up PubSub subscriptions, which are writing, or BigQuery subscriptions, which are writing our topics directly to real tables, um, as opposed to running data flow jobs, which are writing to GCS. So that was a kind of insane realization for us. Um, the other really crazy thing we've seen for pricing is the impact of the schema coder. So the default coder in Java is called the serializable coder. And so the idea is that Java just has the, you, you implement serializable. And it's a way for, it's an interface for a class to serialize itself into bytes. The schema coder, because we assign a schema to the data type, it realizes it doesn't need to encode the entire class, it just needs to encode these specific you know, attributes. Um, and it's just much more efficient. 
Um, so what we were able to see was if we make sure that our peak collection has a schema assigned to it, uh, we can see for our like standard metric type, we see a reduction from uh, 335 bytes to 139 bytes. Um, and that's a direct impact on streaming engine costs. So streaming engine costs are that, the which I think is the streaming data process skew. That is our largest billing item for most of our data flow jobs. Um, and being able to bring that down has been absolutely key. And this is one of these crazy things where just like making sure there's a schema assigned to the P collection is straight money. Um, and you can actually kind of test this out yourself, and I recommend exploring different coder options. You can just, in a you know Java test or something, you can create two coders and try ser try serializing with the coder to some sort of um, to a uh, byte output stream, and then just measure how many bytes it is. And this is how much money you will save from streaming engine largely. Um, the price ultimately comes down to it's a little bit complicated track because it comes down to the I, from what we've seen, it's the different. It's the uh, size or the rate, the throughput of bytes between few stages, and it's also the um, whenever you're doing some sort of state or some sort of like group by key, which I guess is when you end up with multiple stages anyway. Um, but yeah, so if we can serialize the piece, the messages smaller, that makes a huge impact. Um, the last really great thing that we've gotten out of um, using Avro and Beam schemas has been a huge improvement to the way that we do this like flexible I.O. Um, so this is a pretty big problem for Odin. Factories are really bad at sending data. Factories were never meant to be connected to the internet. They were built in places with really bad ISPs. They have all these weird network problems inside of them. Um, and us getting data at factories has just been forever a pain. Um, and so often what we see with factories is that network will go down for some reason, for maybe an hour, for maybe a day, sometimes two weeks, sometimes the ISP, sometimes it's that we are running on the same Wi-Fi network as the vending machines, sometimes it's there was a storm that came through and blew over a satellite dish and they had to hire a union worker to put back up the satellite dish and they send us two weeks of super late data and it ruins everything. So for us, after dealing with a lot of issues, we over a long period of time, we came to this, uh, this strategy of uh, how we are going to handle late data. Um, and so for us, late data is not like a few seconds date late. The late data will be hours or days late. And so anything older than a certain threshold immediately gets shuffled off by a first data flow job and written into GCS to be processed later. Um, then every one of our streaming jobs uh, uses one of these generic read and write IO kind of um, uh, source and sync P transforms to that allow us to deploy the job in a batch mode. Um, and then once a night, every single night, we basically have an Airflow DAG that runs, checks to see if there was any late data that was run that came in last night, and then kicks off each one of our streaming jobs in order. And instead of reading and writing to PubSub, in this case, we're reading and writing to GCS, which has been really, really effective. Um, now, we originally did this with a bunch of JSON payloads, and it was an absolute disaster. I mean, it was the code worked, but it was really, really gross. And something really great about using Avro and Beam schemas is we can write this generic reader and writer in a way where it doesn't really matter. Like the details about the class matter a lot less. Um, so for example, this was, uh, I think this was roughly how it worked before. So we have this kind of like example reader. And you can see that basically there's some sort of options we pass in. We'll say it's currently in pub sub mode or file mode or BigQuery mode, and it will read in that mode. and then. On the right side, we can say it's writing to PubSub, it's writing to files, it's writing to files windows, continuously writing, or even just writing to log, which is really nice for development purposes. You can just say write in log mode and just prints out everything. Um, this is really great if you're a person like me who forgets you have flights, um, and then you're like, oh my god, I have to work from a plane, and everything that I'm doing requires network. Uh, it's really easy to just pull down a subscription, and that's all Avro, and dump it into a file. And suddenly, your online thing where you're continually pulling from PubSub, you now just have a file you can work with, assuming that you trust your generic reader. Um, it also works really great for writing integration tests. If you have this realization that you just changed a bunch of code and uh, you don't know if it's going to work, this is actually ha part of how we translated from our, uh, our Python implementation of some of our code to Java, was we could just dump all the data into Avro files and then read all that data in a batch mode in Avro files and confirm on a per customer basis, are there any weird quirks with their data? Uh, so it's really great for integration tests. 
It's really great also for these situations where you have to rerun a job for a specific set of data. So all of our data ends up in BigQuery, so we can actually write really specific BigQueries that will let us do backfills for specific jobs um, for just a subset of our data. Um, and this one's just been really nice. Um, and I think it's going to be a lot better now that we're actually writing to BigQuery actual tables as opposed to BigQuery external tables for performance reasons. Um, but it's just it opens up a lot of really cool options for using Beam. Um, and doing it in Avro really makes things, like things are just very smooth. So for example, in this case, uh, we still have the file, the pub sub, and the BigQuery as our different readers. And you can see that with Avro IO, we just read it with Beam schemas. With pub sub IO, we just read it with the, um, we just read it with, read Avros with Beam schemas. And then for things like BigQuery, even though we're not reading Avro files, we can actually convert it back into the Avro class. So we can just read BigQuery rows directly out of BigQuery and then just pretend they were Avro. And then everything downstream works which is pretty cool. Um, and then within your job, we just have this little like, we have a consistent options class that all of our jobs, all of our pipelines inherit from this like read options or write options. And we can then just say, okay, read all the Avros for this particular class and then convert it to our internal representation. And now it doesn't matter when we deploy this job if it's um, like this pipeline is built and it's only when we go to deploy it, do we decide is it's running in batch mode or streaming mode. Um, there's also one really other great thing that's about this is that it lets you do kind of these, um, these uh, class in specific transformations to your data. So something we deal with a lot of is we want to assign an event time to all of our data that's coming through. Uh, if we do this with, uh, when we did this in the past, what we had to do is we had to make every single class that we were using that would be translated from JSON implement the same interface, uh, some sort of interface which would say, I will give you the event timestamp and I can use it for this thing. Um, instead, we can actually just use this consistent attribute in all of our pay, in our, all of our Avro payloads, something like you know, uh, event timestamp milliseconds, and we can just create these p transforms, which can convert them back into rows, um, and then identify, you know, what the event timestamp is, assign that with my favorite function with allowed timestamp skew, um, and then convert them back into the Avro class. So this is actually embedded in our reader. So event time is consistent regardless of if we're reading from PubSub or BigQuery or files in Avro anywhere. And Windows just kind of work straight out of the box. Um, so yeah, so in summary, uh, Avro is great. Uh, it's great at serializing and deserializing. Um, it makes things really small. Um, it's pretty easy to use in most languages, um, and it's especially powerful when you combine it with Dataflow, PubSub, BigQuery, um, GCS. All these things just kind of like mesh with Avro really well. Um, Beam schemas, also awesome. Um, they give you access to some really nice P transforms. Um, using them together is really good. When you use them together, I recommend you make a sandwich. You do Avro on the outside, on the top and the bottom, and you immediately convert into some sort of internal representation class that lets you have a consistent API within your jobs, and you can keep evolving your schemas externally. Um, uh, the most useful thing to know is to add that decorator into your Avro classes, your generated Avro classes, by adding it into the Beam schema JSON file itself, um, and to not use Python. Um, I mean, I would love to keep using Python. It does make me feel really good to write Python. Um, and then it makes me really sad to run it. <laughs> and together, they make streaming jobs really cheap. Um, so it's a cheap way to do pub sub. Uh, it's the BigQuery subscriptions, it turns out, are really cheap in this kind of new era where we have compressed data. That probably depends on your data. But for us, for time series data, it's a really big deal. Um, and the schema coder is a shockingly great way to save money. Um, I actually had a comparison job that I did for this talk where I ran two jobs side by side and one was half the cost of the other. And then I realized that I hadn't even properly de-schemified the cheaper job. It's, it's a huge difference to use schemas. Um, so I didn't have any good numbers to throw here. Um, and the last thing is that when you use them together, you can create really flexible I.O. So flexible I.O. is like a really key thing for Odin, and it's a key thing if you deal with late data, in my opinion, or if you just want a good development environment. Um, and yeah, Avro I.O. Avro IO just, or PubSub I.O. with Avro just makes it easy to do. Um, and 
Now we're in this nice place where all of our data types, in addition to metrics, all these intervals, all these different things we process, they all have Avro definitions, and they all just kind of mesh into these different jobs. And that's all I got. Questions? <laughs>